all these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. Welcome back to the next episode of the BC Law Just Law Podcast. I'm Tom Blakely. I'm here with Samantha Bear and uh, Andrew Lelling, the former U.S. Attorney for the District of Massachusetts, currently a uh, attorney at Jones Day and professor of trial practice uh, here at BC Law. He's going to be joining us to talk about his career uh, and some cases he was involved in and uh, you know things would be things things people will be pretty interested in. So, uh, Professor, is it Professor Andy? Uh, Call me Andy. Andy. Andy, thank you for joining us, Andy. Um, so uh, we just want to, first off, just talk about your career. I know, you, Sam, you had a question about that. I mean, we know, obviously, former U.S. Attorney Jones Day, your teacher here doing it all but uh if you want to just tell us about yourself you know you're a lawyer what made you go to law school where you're from sam anything you, yeah, you have just on your that? journey to yeah. becoming a u.s attorney uh you know it's funny I, you know it, as most people know u.s attorneys are prosecutors yeah i had no desire to be a prosecutor until i was actually in practice um you know went to law school i think like many people who didn't know quite what they wanted to do you know frustrated english majors who needed to make a living english yeah. and history majors uh, but political once, science. It, you know, see, there yeah. you go. Philosophy. Uh, but see, <laughs> welcome to the club. <laughs> but once in uh, law school, what I found is that um, criminal justice issues were what was most interesting to me, specifically um, the questions of when are people responsible for what they do? Why are they held responsible for what they do? What should happen to them if they're held responsible for what they do? And so if you're interested in those issues, you're probably going to eventually wind up doing criminal law because that's where those issues pop up. So left law school, went to a clerkship for a year. Uh, after that, went to a big firm in Manhattan, uh, then a big firm in Boston because my then fiance was up here and showed no signs of ever leaving, so I had to come up here. Um, but what I found in private practice was two things. You know, people ask me a lot, should I go to a big firm from law school? And I always yeah. say yes which I think a lot of people don't say. I say, yes, go. Go for three years or so. Get the training. You learn quality control. You learn how to do really sophisticated work. Then go leave and do what you really want to do. Mm-hmm. But put in those three years or so. And then after that, you'll take stock. And so that's what I did. I was in a big firm for about, uh, for longer than that, I think. I was in firms for about three years in New York, about three years here in Boston. Mm-hmm. What was clear to me was that I wanted work that had more of a sense of mission, okay. and that would get me into court. And you just can't do that in the private sector, right? I At a firm, to, yeah, a big yeah, firm. It, yeah, you can't do that in a big firm. I, I wanted, You can do pro bono work on the side and stuff, but I wanted my main job to be um, you know, something that had a greater purpose. And so that drew me to join the Justice Department. So okay. that's why I wound up doing that. Very good. And uh, b- before law school, like what? First of all, where did you grow up? What made you decide I want to try to be a lawyer? How did you? Uh, how, did, how did you? How did you decide on that? I actually wanted to be an architect. Okay. For a long time. <laughs> but after actually taking some like courses, George Costanza in Seinfeld, right? <laughs> That's the great reference. Right. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, you know, it, I, 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 I took courses in that direction in uh, high school. It quickly became clear that was not going to happen. Okay. Right. Um, once in college. I actually had some interest in the law, and I think my skill set sort of tended that way, okay. right? And so I wasn't I wasn't entirely kidding before when I see I was an English and history major. Law school looked like it involved skills that um, I had, and so I went and did it. And then once there, sort of found the area that I enjoyed, which was you know which was uh, sort of issues of personal responsibility. I'm actually from New York okay. uh, originally. Okay. Uh, went to college in New York. Went to law school in Philly. Um, clerked in savannah georgia oh which was awesome all right oh, yeah. what made it awesome uh, uh savannah is a great town you ever yeah. been to savannah i've not savannah is fantastic it's, all right it, it's uh i remember landing in savannah at the savannah international airport and uh to interview for my clerkship mm-hmm. so and what year out, is this this is 1993 okay so i get out of the airport and i hop in a cab and the cabbie, it, it's quite clear to her that I'm not from there. Right. Right. I can tell. And so she's bragging about Savannah and how beautiful it is. And she's saying okay. Savannah is a gorgeous town because it's one of the few towns that wasn't burned. Mm. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? And then it took about 30 seconds. And then it dawned on me that she is talking about Sherman's March. In the Civil Georgia War. In the Civil War. In 1993. <laughs> That's what she is talking about. Wow. And just assumes that I would get the, I would get the reference. Yeah. I was like... 
wow, I am not in Manhattan anymore. No. Right no. Yeah, not in Kansas anymore, for sure. Uh, but that is why Savannah is a beautiful town. It's a gorgeous antebellum okay. uh, town, and it was a great it was a great year there. Yeah. Um, so then uh, at a certain point in time, you uh, you become the U.S. Attorney in Massachusetts. How did that – did you That's think that would be your role eventually? How did that, how did that come to be? The way that came about is um, – I joined the Justice Department in, a, in an unusual way. Mm-hmm. And I joined the Justice Department in 2001. What most people do is they apply for a job as a, an assistant United States attorney. Yeah, you, you, you send in your application, you do all that, and maybe they pick you, and you're, you're a career line prosecutor. Right. I didn't do that. Yeah. The way I entered the Justice Department was a mentor of mine, this guy named Ralph Boyd, was appointed to run the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department when the Bush administration came in mm-hmm. and took me with him as his deputy. And so it's a political appointment. It's not a career appointment. You're yeah. working for the administration, mm-hmm. right? And I was philosophically aligned enough with the administration that I could do that. So, so you, I mean, I, I hate to use the term marked, but at that point, you're, you're, a, you're a Bush guy? Is that the way that it works? Yeah. Okay. And that is a little bit how it works. Yeah. You're a political appointee. Yeah. And uh, I did that for a few years in Washington. Okay. And what happens when you do that is you build a reputation in political circles. Mm-hmm. You become a known quantity. Mm-hmm. And so fast forward through the Obama administration to the Trump administration, mm-hmm. and the administration needs a United States attorney in Boston. Okay. And if you're in D.C. and you're at the White House or the Justice Department, and you're trying to figure out who should be the U.S. attorney in Boston. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of known quantities running around Boston. Right. Right. It's a generally liberal city. It's a right. blue state. And so it's a small list of people mm-hmm. where the people who make these decisions in D.C. will think to themselves, ah, well, this will be someone who thinks like us and will implement the president's okay. agenda. And so that's that's a short list. Yeah. And so that gave me, I think, a little bit of a leg up. On, mm-hmm. on others here because okay. I mean there's always competition for these jobs right and and that is how that worked out but it was not something that I expected you know years and years ago sure now, now before turning to some of the the cases you're involved in what you know sort of traits you know interests passions does a successful you know having been the U.S. attorney in Massachusetts does a successful U.S. attorney in Massachusetts need that maybe someone in another state might not need so I guess another way of looking at it is what types of Issues, shenanigans, et cetera, are particularly the case in Massachusetts that you need to be particularly equipped to deal with as opposed to some other states. Is there something as a U.S. attorney in Massachusetts that you particularly need to have a you know an interest or a skill set in to, to be successful here? I, I think what I would say is the, the issues you have to think about if you're the United States attorney in Boston or mm-hmm. the issues you have to think about if you are the U.S. attorney for any major urban center. Mm-hmm. There is a set of issues that big city U.S. attorneys have to deal with. Right. The, the the politics are a little more vicious. Like mm-hmm. You have to stay out of politics, mm-hmm. but others will attempt to involve you in politics. You're dealing with a bunch of competing constituencies. Right. Mm-hmm. You have all the federal agencies, the FBI, the DEA, the IRS, the Department of Homeland Security, all of those mm-hmm. sort of jostling for attention uh, and for, you know, uh, airtime. Right. They want you to do their cases. Right. Mm-hmm. And they want you to do things a certain way and maybe. All of their interests sort of conflict a little bit. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. You have to deal with uh, big city police departments mm-hmm. who may want your help or may not want your help. Mm-hmm. Uh, something specific to somewhere like Boston, which is heavily identified with one side of the political aisle to right. be a blue state. If you are the Republican U.S. attorney in this state, mm-hmm. you have to tread carefully. You have to think about how you deal with the press, the press may or may not be entirely on your side, philosophically speaking. Yeah. How do you deal with major political figures, right? We have Senator Elizabeth Warren. We have you know, Senator Markey. Mm-hmm. Um, things like that. And you have to think about how you present your message, how you calibrate your message okay. uh, for the public. So, again, if you're a big city U.S. attorney, there's a whole list of ways to blow it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and day to day, you're just trying to not blow it mm-hmm. and pray that by the end of your tenure, mm-hmm. you can look back and, and have successfully bobbed and weaved your way around, you know, all the landmines that come up every day. So just one follow up on that. So when you land at the you know U.S. attorney's office in Boston, you have, you know, as you said, the, the political dynamics of Massachusetts, the, the DAs, the media, the mayor, you know, just the, the leadership here is is going to the left of the slash to, to, to put it mildly now, now if you're as you said before you know you're you know uh, conservative appointee you know there's different way trump appointee there's different ways people are going to characterize that what was that like i mean was it a 
Was it a warm reception? People want to work together? Was there um, a- apprehension among some of these people you have to work alongside? Or how was that initially out of the gate? Well, within the office, it was fine because mm-hmm. I had been in the Boston U.S. Attorney's Office okay. for about 14 years by that point. Mm-hmm. That was a huge help because mm-hmm. I was a known quantity. Right. Most people there, you know, they, they, they knew I was a good prosecutor. I was respected in the office. Um, so they, they didn't have concerns along those lines. It would have been harder coming in as a Republican U.S. attorney if you hadn't worked in the office mm-hmm. before. What surprised me most coming into the job was the press. The press was not nearly as hostile as I expected, because not only am I coming in as a once in future Republican political appointee, but mm-hmm. it's the Trump administration. Right. Yeah. Right. And if you're in Boston, everybody hates the Trump administration. Mm-hmm. So much acrimony, you know, so much political polarization. When you say press, local press, so like the Globe, the four, I, five, yes. seven. Okay. I mean, from local to national. You, okay. you deal with both as U.S. attorney, mm-hmm. especially when some big cases kick off like Varsity Blues and all right. that. You're dealing with the Boston Globe. You're dealing with the Boston Herald. You're dealing with local TV. You're also dealing with the national cable news and all of that. But I, I'm in on a local level. Mm-hmm. So, like, I have to say, outlets like the Globe, uh, NPR, WBUR, much more fair to me, I thought, that, than they would be when mm-hmm. I first came in. And I'm not saying they always wrote something glowing. I mean, they were often critical. Right. But all of it was within bounds. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I, I, I didn't perceive any cheap shots mm-hmm. along the way. That actually surprised me. And, wow. I, I was, and I was pleasantly surprised by that. So during my tenure, I actually had a pretty good relationship mm-hmm. with the Boston Globe, uh, with the Herald, which was easier. And and with the local NPR affiliate and with outlets that are traditionally left-leaning, right, even though they knew that I was more right-leaning. And so that went well. Okay. Um, just turn next to, you know, a couple of cases that you, you know, re- really dominated the headlines. Speaking of media, uh, Varsity Blues, you know, everybody thinks of this as, oh, it's the college admission scandal. It's the yeah. celebrities getting hauled in from Beverly Hills to testify about how they paid their kids away. You know, everyone, everyone's heard of it. What is this case really about, in your opinion, prosecutor? Where did it come from? How did it come to be? What, what really went on in that case? That case actually kicked off by accident. Hmm. I wish I could say it was some, like, preconceived push to unearth corruption in college admissions. Like, no. <laughs> that's, that's not what happened. Good. What happened was, um, and this has been reported on before, what happened was we were investigating a, a, a run-of-the-mill securities fraud case, and we interviewed a witness in that case. Right. And I think this witness feared that he might become a target in mm-hmm. our investigation. And he's like, look, you know, I have some information I can give you, but I've got a really good lead on something unrelated to this. Mm-hmm. The um, women's soccer coach at Yale mm-hmm. is taking bribes to, to get people into the school. And we're like, wow, that's kind of interesting. Now, is this common when you're looking at somebody like, oh, you know, you should really be looking at this. Is that it doesn't happen this, as often? This is rare. Think. Yeah, it happens sometimes. Usually it is a lead on something related to what that witness does. Mm-hmm. Um, so what would have been more common is for his, him to give us a lead on a securities fraud scam of some kind that some buddy of his is doing. But that's not what he did. He said, uh, Yale women's soccer coach is taking bribes to help get kids in to Yale. You should look at that. We're like, okay, that's kind of interesting. So we wire up this witness. This witness meets with the Yale soccer coach. Turns out it's true. Mm-hmm. Now we have the recording. This is the FBI doing this. This is the FBI doing okay. this. Um, then we go confront Yale women's soccer coach who folds and uh, cooperates, and we wire him up. And he goes and meets with Rick Singer, mm. the guy who is the mastermind of the Varsity Blues college admissions scandal. And uh, it turns out that it's true. You know, Singer's the guy. And now we have this recording of Singer, and we confront Singer. And Singer... Roles. And he sings. Up, he yeah. sings exactly, uh. and he winds up cooperating uh, with the government. You know, I mean, there were there were, you know one or two additional small steps along the way, but that is basically what happened. Mm-hmm. And the importance of Singer's cooperation is you have a case that went from a narrow frame, where you could charge you know X number of people, to having visibility on the entire operation. So once you have Singer's cooperation. It illuminates the entire conspiracy because he obviously is the guy running it. And so he's able, he knows every person involved. Mm -hmm. And so once you have secured his cooperation and have decided to use his cooperation, then it's just a matter of going down the list of names he has identified and figuring out whether you can corroborate 
that those people were involved. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is roughly what we did. Okay. And we did not know at the beginning that this would lead to household names, right? You know, Lori Laughlin, yeah. names like, we, we, didn't, we didn't know alone, that, yeah. you know, we didn't know that. Um, it just kind of panned out that way. So when Singer began, we began digging into it through our own investigation, through Singer talking to us, we began to see who was really involved in this. Then you knew you had a, you had a, a major case with a national profile. What was your reaction when everything started kind of unraveling into the whole mess that it was or the office's reaction just in general? Oh, uh, this was an awesome case. <laughs> I mean, this was great. We, we would have um, regular meetings about the case, and the group of line prosecutors who were doing the case would come back and say, look, you know, we have this, we have that. And so we quickly knew we had what was going to be, um, you know, it, probably the most important federal criminal prosecution of that year. I think that was 2018 going into 2019, I think is when we announced it. And so um, it was interesting to see them build the case. You know, it, it was interesting to figure out where we could come up with enough evidence, didn't have enough evidence. You wind up with extremely difficult charging decisions. Like you're not talking about, um, you know, drug cartels, right? You're talking about parents whose kids are going to college. And so I'll give you a good example. You had instances where parents were involved, but it varied whether their kids were involved. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so there were one or two instances where we had recordings of telephone calls where the student applying is clearly in on it. Mm. You know, they'll be on a call, you know, the parents, the Were kid, they minors at this point, usually? Singer. If they were minors, we, we would not charge yeah. minors, but some of them were 18. And so you have to deal with the question of, is there a scenario in which we would charge any of the kids who were involved? And that was a very interesting question. In fact, I remember sitting in that meeting with my senior staff, where we were going to really hammer out this issue. And I remember thinking to myself, like, this is why I do this job. Like, no one gets to do this. This is the cool, I would do this for free. They don't even need to pay me to do this. And we, and we decided, as everyone knows, that no, we're not going to charge. It's going to be hard enough for the kids once mm -hmm. this blows up right. that we were not going to charge any, uh, any of the kids in the case. Did you have, uh, I guess, two questions. One, were there expectations, you know, as you're working on this, do you have expectations for how this one unfold? And number two, you talked about the kids. What about the universities themselves, which were taking a lot of cash um, in, in this in this whole scheme? Well, I, going into the case, uh, as the case developed, I did not have expectations for what would result. No. Um, I, I'm too experienced a prosecutor for that. Mm -hmm. You don't want to push it. You want to bring a case that you can justify and that you can prove and that is in the public interest. So I didn't like lay down markers for the team developing the case and say, oh, my God, we have to charge this person. It wasn't like that. The set of targets we came up with that we could justify charging and that we could prove that's what we would do. And that's the case that we brought. As to the universities, the universities are victims in the case. The mm -hmm. universities were deceived by the fake credentials that the students submitted and that certain coaches helped push through the process. Mm -hmm. So that was the theory of the government's case, right? It's a fraud case. The victims of the fraud are the schools mm -hmm. that uh, let in students they may not have otherwise let in. There's a perception among many Americans that, you know, uh, this case comes out and it's like, oh, well, of course, that's what was going on. Of course, you know, the, the, the game is rigged against people like me. And I think a lot of people have the perception that, you know, the, these schools are, you know, particularly very prestigious schools with massive endowments are getting a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's interesting, the point that you made that the, 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 to see the schools as victims, do you think many people do um, in the court of public opinion? Or, or do you think people are um, a little bit misguided about that? Well, you know, having sympathy for the schools yeah. is different than acknowledging that the schools were, were deceived. So um, I think schools were deceived. But it's tough to have a tremendous amount of sympathy for the schools that right. have these massive, you know, billion dollar plus yeah. uh, endowments. And a distinction we took pains to draw during the case is, and people would often ask this, look, why is this different than a wealthy parent donating a building? Right. Right. And in exchange, their kid gets into school. And the reason why it's different is that that doesn't involve deception. Mm -hmm. Right. We could bring the college admissions case because it involves fraud. 
Right. Someone is lying about something. Someone else is relying on that lie and yeah. proceeding in a way. So to be clear what we're talking about, we're talking about somebody with a lot of money says, I'm going to donate X millions of dollars to build a library on the campus versus somebody says, here's, you know, $500,000 that, you know, under the table. Mm-hmm. Well, the difference is the parent who says, I'll donate $10 million and build a library for mm-hmm. you if you take my kid. Mm-hmm. That's one thing. That is not illegal. What's illegal is... You conspire with someone like Rick Singer, who you pay a few hundred grand, and you submit fake credentials, mm-hmm. and the school relies on those fake credentials and, and admits okay. your kid. There's actual fraud. There is a, there is a, a false statement. So it, In the first scenario, there's no false statement. It's just kind of skeevy. All right. So, so I, you know, you have at the ultra high end, you know, where we're naming buildings after you, that's legitimate. It's when you're paying Singer his fee of, you know, it's, I mean, you, you hate to look at it like it's a it, inexpensive, you know, with respect to any average American's finances, but a few hundred thousand dollars to get into his scheme and he's going to go talk to people. He's going to do his photoshopping and everything everyone's seen in the documentaries. And, the, and that's illegal. That's fraudulent. Right. And like, Singer, uh-huh. Singer would actually advertise his services. That right. Way. He would say to parents, Look, if you wanted to influence the admissions process by making a donation, you would need like 10 million bucks. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to charge you a quarter million dollars per kit. Mm-hmm. But what he was doing on the back end was fabricating fabricating credentials yeah. showing that the kid had done things that the kid had not actually done. Okay. Right? And and the coaches would facilitate submitting those credentials, basically saying that the kid is a an ass, a standout athlete when right. the kid wasn't. And they'd get in that way. Was there uh friction in bringing this case because the the defendants here by and large you know like we alluded to earlier are you know well-known well-liked celebrities we're talking about uh their kids are celebrities and influencers we're talking sure. about you know a, you know influencers we're talking about people you know in the the media ultimately who are who are you know well liked by the media these are you know big west coast hollywood names that uh-huh. it becomes uh it's, it's a little surreal to see you know uh, Lori laughlin in front of the joe moakley courthouse in yep. boston was there friction at all in terms of these people trying to you know make phone calls and trying to get off the hook or or was it the the condemnation here fairly unanimous well there was no there was no friction before we brought the case Mm -hmm. meaning within the department right the justice department in dc you know sort of our distant superiors Mm -hmm. very supportive of the case Mm -hmm. loved the case i mean you know i I talked to the ag about the case yeah they thought they thought it was awesome Mm -hmm. once we brought the case all the defendants or i should say the vast majority of them, hired, you know, very high-end, very sophisticated, white-collar defense attorneys. Mm-hmm. And there's that kind of friction. Right. There's an aggressively litigated case um, on both sides. But you did not have the problem of very connected lawyers sort of go, trying to go up the chain to Washington mm-hmm. to try to impact the outcome of this case. Mm-hmm. I expected some of that. Yeah. Not, we actually didn't have that, which I thought was interesting. Mm-hmm. I don't think it would have mattered Mm-hmm. Um, people on the outside tend to overestimate how much that, how much of an impact mm-hmm. those kinds of things can have. Right. But what you really had was just trench warfare in federal court in Boston, you know, defendant by defendant. A lot of which you saw spill out into the into the press. It was a very aggressively litigated case. If this many people were caught, and I know it's hard to say, how much more of this is there out there that's going on? I think there's more of it out there, but. It seems to us that, well, when I say us, I mean, you know, the government, that it, this stood out as an extremely well-organized effort, right? And so I think maybe not entirely unique, but really rare. This kind of fraud, I think, probably happens on a one-off basis mm-hmm. on occasion. I mean, like 2 million kids go to college every year, and there's lots of schools, and so shenanigans happen. But this kind of ambitious national organized effort going back years. I don't think there's a lot of those. Um, I think Rick Singer was just quite good at putting this together and it just rapidly expanded into this sort of mini empire. So talking about the litigation, what kind of arguments were the defense making and were any of them like particularly convincing to you? Um, The arguments the defense made over time, most of them we anticipated. That's not to fault the defense attorneys, just that we tried to game out the case, and I think we really game out most of it. And so there, uh, there were, there are several sort of highly technical defenses, right? So, for example, wire fraud under federal law requires you to have deprived someone of property, 
is a college admission slot property? Very interesting question. There's actually a few cases on that, but not that many. That'll be a big issue on appeal in some of the in some of these cases, right? So we knew that issue would be out there. On a factual level, uh, in fact, um, there's a trial going on in Boston right now for one of the water polo coaches who was being prosecuted, and um, one of his defenses, and one that we've seen before, uh, the government has seen before, is um, the coach claiming to not be aware. Right, that the credentials are fabricated. So, student sends fabricated credentials to the coach. So we're talking about pleading ignorant. Yeah, yeah. but you know, it, it, sometimes it can be difficult to show that the coach knows. We know Rick Singer knows, but is it a scenario where the student and Rick Singer conspire on the application? Application goes to coach. Coach doesn't know that the credentials are fake. Mm-hmm. So we encounter that argument sometimes. Um, You would encounter the argument from parent defendants that, similarly, they did not know that the money they were giving to Rick Singer that he was using as a bribe. So they know they give this chunk of money to Rick Singer, right? And then Rick Singer gives some of that money to the coach that he is bribing. Does the parent know that that's even happening? Mm -hmm. And so some of these defenses were kind of swirling, were kind of swirling around, and the facts vary for every one of these parents and every one of these coaches. And there were like, I forget exactly how many defendants, but over fifty. I think we charged a total of fifty-seven uh, people in this case. Um. So obviously, this is a really important case. What do you think the impacts of it are? just going forward for maybe the class of people involved or the criminal justice in general? Well, I think the impact broadly, like on a national basis, over time is like zero. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I just do. I mean, what what made that case such a privilege is that you are doing a case that becomes part of a national conversation, right? Everyone's heard of the case. It's become sort of a cultural touchstone. You never get to do. I mean, that's really rare. You know, most you know federal prosecutors will have an entire career where they've never got to do that. So we were very lucky that we were able to do that. So everyone's heard of it. People thought college admissions had its corrupt aspects anyway. I don't think this really changed many minds about anything. I, I, I do think the schools probably tightened up some of their admissions procedures to make sure this doesn't happen again. As to these particular defendants. None of them will do this again. I mean, if you were looking for what we call specific deterrence of these, they're deterred. I mean, none of these people are hardened criminals or something, Mm -hmm. right? I think many, many of them sincerely, deeply regret ever having done this. Mm -hmm. In fact, it reminds me of watching, uh, I attended uh, Felicity Huffman's plea hearing and sentencing. And it was very clear that she couldn't believe that she had gotten herself involved in this. I mean, mm-hmm. just sort of sincerely regretted having gotten within a thousand yards of this and sort of spoke eloquently about the pressure she felt as a parent, right? And, and you know, how it affected her judgment, caused her to do this. And she wasn't excusing her behavior. She was more just explaining how she found herself, you know, mm-hmm. in, this, in this place. And the line prosecutor who spoke at her sentencing, and I actually had fed him this line when we were preparing, got up and said, look, you know, that may be so, but there's millions of parents in the United States and they have millions of kids going to college and they don't go pay some guy to help them Mm -hmm. defraud schools. And that was true. And, you know, I think that prosecution was fair and we should have done it. But I think that that defendant, uh, Huffman, and many others, when they got up at their sentencing and spoke to the court, um, that they sincerely regretted ever having gotten involved in this. It, it like seemed like a good idea at the time and mm-hmm. just wasn't. I have one last question on Varsity Blues, and we want to talk about another uh, case you're involved in. And, you know, it might be a little bit hard to say, but, you know, you prosecuted this case. You know, you heard the the, the, the FBI wiretaps and people bugged up. You know, you see you're familiar with all the, the evidence of this case. You know, in law school and criminal law, you know, the building block of uh, of, of criminal laws, there's, there's mens rea, right? Everybody is... I'm sure, Sure, here. It's been to law school. is very familiar with that. To put it uh, as simply as possible, did these celebrities know what they were doing was wrong? Well, I think it, it varies case by case, right? And so the government alleged, yes, that they absolutely knew what they were doing was wrong. And we, we wouldn't bring the case defendant by defendant unless we thought we could prove that. But then you got to actually prove it. 
And where they're able to is going to vary, you know, parent by parent, coach by coach. So I think there is a spectrum there. Mm -hmm. But our theory was, yes, you know, these parents knew had to, you know, either either we had evidence that they did, in fact, know or circumstantial evidence that they must have known mm -hmm. that this was not on the up and up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we tried to include only those. But each one of those cases will be individually litigated. Each of those parents has a shot at proving that that was not so. And so, you know, three years later, I think it is about three years later now, right? It, yeah. yeah. Almost exactly. Almost exactly yeah. three years. It's, yeah, it's three years, you know, a week or so ago. Mm -hmm. That's why you still have these proceedings mm -hmm. uh, going on as each defendant sort of hashes it out with the government. Yeah. Uh, I want to transition to another case um, that was, you know, very much in the headlines, particularly um, locally is uh, United States versus Joseph. You had this judge, uh, Shelley Joseph, in the Newton District Court right up the, the street from here, probably at a... A court that at a national level, few people are familiar with, but for this case, <laughs> in uh, 2018, you had um, this judge who, you know, and, and you'll probably be able to speak to it much, much better than I can. But, you know, the basic facts of it are, you know, this is someone who uh, was hearing a case uh, in front of a uh, defendant. Uh, ICE was at the courthouse to try to uh, apprehend this individual on immigration related mm -hmm. um, matters. The judge, when notified this, um, he term, uh, obstruction of justice, among other things. Locally, among uh, the district attorneys, the attorney general, basically the Boston legal intelligentsia, folks generally pretty upset about that prosecution. And yet, a little bit. A little bit. yeah, just a little bit, I'd say. <laughs> and here we are, I think just a few weeks ago, um, a federal judge ruled on this case, uh, basically denying, um, you know, former Judge Joseph's, uh, you know, motion to try to, um, I think it was. It was basically um, dismiss, the dismiss the case um, in 2022. So four years after this happened, this is this is still going on. And I'm sure, you know, particularly locally, everyone has a political opinion about um, what went on in the case. But as, as with Varsity Blues, I'll ask the same question. What is this case actually about? You know, what were the facts separate apart from the political maelstrom in the media? Um, how did it come about? What, what, what went on here um, to you at the time in terms of the, the facts of the case separate and apart from the politics? Well, basically what happens in this case, as you described, is um, there is a defendant in front of Judge Joseph on a, on a drug charge, mm -hmm. right? And he's in the country illegally. And ICE is aware of this, and there is an ICE officer way in the courtroom waiting to arrest this person uh, on, a, on a, a civil arrest warrant uh, for deportation after the proceeding is over. So uh, Judge Joseph... Um, asks the ICE officer to wait outside, to wait in the front lobby. Of the courthouse. Of the courthouse. Uh -huh. and, he, and he leaves the courtroom and he goes and does that. And then, and, and I should say, this is what the indictment alleges. Mm -hmm. I need to be careful because she is not convicted. Mm -hmm. She's innocent until mm -hmm. someone proves her guilty. Mm -hmm. So if these things are true, right, as we say in the indictment, if these things are true, it's a problem. She sends the guy out of the courtroom, right? Yeah. Then she has the hearing with this defendant. She calls the lawyers up to sidebar. She turns off the recording device mm -hmm. and, according to the indictment, essentially conspires with the defense attorney to allow this defendant to leave out the back door of the courthouse, out the lockup downstairs mm -hmm. that the court security officers have, instead of out the front so that he can avoid being arrested by ICE. Mm -hmm. Right? Turns the tape back on, speaks for a few minutes to create a pretext for the defendant going downstairs to lock up, defense attorney says, I think my guy left something down in lockup. Mm -hmm. Judge Joseph says, oh, okay, you can go down there. Mm -hmm. And then hearing ends, guy goes down there, court security officer opens the back door, mm -hmm. and the guy takes off. So just to interject there, so at, at that point, and again, from the, those facts you just described, the facts that are alleged, what, what, what crimes are committed there? If this is true, mm -hmm. if all of this did occur, and she has the right mens rea, as mm. you noted, then uh, that's obstru you're obstructing a federal proceeding, mm -hmm. right? There's a federal officer in the courthouse waiting to arrest somebody. Mm -hmm. You have specifically, willfully helped this person evade arrest by a federal <laughs> officer by running out the back door of the courthouse. You can't do that. That's a crime. Mm. Um, the indictment alleges that after this occurred, uh, long before the involvement of the federal government, comes to the attention of Judge Joseph's superiors, and she lies to them about what happened in the court that day. The trial court, Massachusetts trial court authorities, don't do anything more 
about it. Um, Why do you think that is? I don't really know. Either they didn't really know the facts or they didn't think it was that big a deal. I, I don't I, I don't really know. And so mm-hmm. I don't want to yeah. attribute anything negative to them. Um, um, some of this is high, maybe, uh, tw- hindsight's twenty twenty too, right? It, it may also just not have, you know, they may not have fully realized the import of, of what had happened here. So more time goes by. And uh, meanwhile, ICE is outraged about this. And ICE comes to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So the ICE agent's in the lobby. You know, at a certain point, he's been sitting there for hours. He literally sits there for hours. Yeah. He literally sits there for hours. I think what happened, though, I'm not sure, someone eventually comes out and says, hey, you know this guy left. Right? Yeah. And, so, and so ICE is, they're outraged. Yeah. Right. Now, what's interesting about this set of facts is two things. One, um... The fact that it was immigration was completely meaningless right. to me. It could the guy could have been in there on any kind of, of federal charge, and I would have reacted the same to this. In fact, in, in the '90s and early 2000s, ATF agents used to show up in local courthouses all the time to arrest defendants on federal gun charges. Mm-hmm. And the reason why the federal agents like to do that is that it is the safest place to arrest somebody, because if a defendant has come into a state courthouse, he's gone through security. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't have a gun or a knife. You can arrest him in the state courthouse and be assured that he's not going to pull a gun. Mm-hmm. So that's why they like to do that. This happened to be an immigration case. I didn't care that it was an immigration case. Second, what always struck me about this case was that if this defendant had been like a black kid in Dorchester, mm-hmm. right, who we had arrested for helping someone evade uh, or evade capture by ICE, mm-hmm. no one would have cared. Right. Right. The press wouldn't have cared. We wouldn't be talking about it. No one would have heard of it. Right. But it's not. Right. It's a white judge in a Tony suburb of Boston who I tagged with helping someone evade ICE. Now everyone cares. Now, that is slightly disingenuous in that obviously what's important is this person is a judge. Right. Right. Not just a person on the street. But the idea that to me, the idea that a judge could be immune, as some have argued, Mm-hmm. from the consequences of what appears to be intentional criminal conduct is crazy, right. crazy. So, uh, before we get to Sam's question, I just want to follow up on that. So you had in response to this, you know, the uh, turning towards the, the, the political piece, you know, you have this patchwork of law review articles and uh, Boston Globe editorial, you know, all these things that come out. Making an argument that sort of sounds like, well, you know, this is a state, you know, it's attorney general, all these people come out, it's state attorney general, um, you know, it's basically, saying, well, you know, this is a state judge, judges have the power to, you know, tremendous dominion over they, how they run their court, uh, who, who, how is it that the federal government can intervene in the proceeding, just these arguments that come out to, 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 to you know, sort of try to, um, you know, obviously from a political side of things people are not happy about this prosecution it seems like they're sort of working backwards from there to explain why it shouldn't have happened um what was your i mean I, and i assume you had a sense for the politics and a sense for how these corners of the state were you know sure. sort of legal circle were going yeah. to react uh, what, what, what is your take on that you know sort of these are these amicus briefs just the arguments that have come out in defense of judge joseph or former judge joseph what what, what, what were your what are your thoughts on that well we knew when we brought it it would be very controversial um, I didn't care about that. Mm-hmm. You, you have to do that job without fear. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going to be scared as a federal prosecutor, don't be a federal prosecutor. Yeah. Don't be any kind of prosecutor, right? Mm-hmm. Because if your decision is going to be guided by fear, you won't be good at the job. Mm-hmm. So I didn't care about that. But we thought hard before doing it because obviously the per, it's an unusual prosecution of someone who is a state judge. Yeah. And so it's going to kick up a hornet's nest. Yes, but that's not why I cared. Right? Right. What I cared was, as a matter of policy, should we be doing that? Yeah. Right. Obviously, there are people who think we should not have done that. People think we should have. You know, should the feds go charge a, a, a state court judge? Or you have to think hard before you do that. So we didn't rush to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things that impacted our decision is that a lot of time passed between the incident and us bringing charges. Right? It's about a year or so, I think. Yeah. yeah. Nothing happened in that time. So in that year... The trial, she suffered no consequences from her superiors in the trial court. Uh, the Judicial Conduct Commission did not receive a referral about this. Nothing was done. The state AG, Maura Healy, did nothing. Right. Even when it leaked to the Boston Globe 
that we had assembled a grand jury. Mm-hmm. So now everyone knows. I think it was like December 2019 that we're or so, looking at. 2018. It was yeah. about a year before we actually brought charges. Yeah. Even after that, nothing. It, and, so, and so wait, yeah. one of the things you think hard about when you do these kinds of cases involving uh, prominent state level officials is has it been dealt with by other means? Right. Maybe we shouldn't get involved because the state has handled it on their own. And that wasn't happening. And so that was one of the things that impacted our, our decision before we brought uh, the case. Um, how much, you know, in, in terms of the, the defense that's come out for Judge Joseph, how much of that is politics and how much of, of, of that are, are actual real legal arguments that have been made? Meaning what? So in other words, you know, it's pretty clear where people on each side of the aisle stand in, in terms of this case. Do you think there are strong um, legal arguments to be made in Judge Joseph's defense? And, and I assume when you were thinking about bringing this case, you're sort of looking at, okay, what, you know, could, could the defenses be? And, you know, because you have prominent officials, attorney general, districts, of people coming out very strong over this case. How much of that is politics and how much of that was, you know, legitimate legal arguments about why she should not be prosecuted or isn't guilty? Oh, I, I think there are there are legitimate arguments in her defense. I mm-hmm. think most of what you saw publicly was just politics. Right. Right. Um, again, the notion, I'll back up a step. You hear a lot about uh, judicial immunity. You hear a lot about uh, this is unprecedented. This is the feds intruding on a state function. Right. But the only way those arguments make sense, in my view, is if you forget that what the government has alleged here and has not yet proven, but will try to, is intentional criminal conduct, right? It's not she's being forced to let ICE into her courtroom. It's not anything like that. It's intentional criminal conduct. The notion that a judge could be immune from prosecution for intentional criminal conduct is crazy, mm-hmm. at least in my view. But this will be, this will be fully litigated. Mm-hmm. On the facts themselves, I, I actually have pretty high confidence in the facts themselves. I think that if this case goes to trial and if the government is able to prove what is alleged in the indictment, I think there is a decent chance that she will be convicted. The, the you know, gasping and pearl clutching that you see in this case does not come from uh, sort of working class and middle class Massachusetts, no. right? It comes from the hyper-educated ranks that we are in, mm-hmm. right? It comes from the globe. It comes from retired judges. It comes from lawyers. That's not your jury, right? And so I think there is sort of a lot of noise, but not a lot of signal Mm -hmm. that you see there. And I think it is easy for, as you point out, in a case like this, you'll see a lot of piling on for a certain side, right? Right, Meaning the side being in her defense. So we'll see what happens. It it could be they find sort of an off-ramp for this case. It's been reported publicly before that um, I offered Judge Joseph a deal before we ever charged her. We offered her what we call a deferred prosecution agreement where, you know, it's like in one year in duration, we won't charge you with anything. In turn, you stay out of trouble. And it would have involved us sort of both working on some kind of joint statement for the public that acknowledges she had done something uh, inappropriate that she shouldn't have done. And, uh, and she did not take that. She did not take that deal. Now, it will be up to new management at the U.S. Attorney's Office, what they want to do uh, mm-hmm. with it. And we'll just have to sort of wait and see. So do you think the justification for punishing Judge Joseph here is purely retributive? No, I don't. I think that um, part of the rationale is retributive in that uh, if, the, uh, if the indictment is true, if that actually happened, then she did something intentionally illegal and she knew it was illegal at the time. And there should be a price to be paid for that. I do think the greater value of the case is in deterrence of others. And I'll tell you why. Um, There's only a handful of states in the United States. I think there are three where state court judges are appointed for life. And while I agree with giving judges life tenure, it tends to cause some judges to think they have the freedom to basically do whatever they want. And that's not true. And so... If the allegations in the indictment are, tr- are, are true, it seems to me that this judge acted out of her own uh, personal political misgivings about immigration enforcement. And 
based on those political misgivings, interfered in a federal proceeding and did it intentionally. You don't want judges doing that. And if this prosecution results in other judges thinking twice before they do something like that, then I think that that is in the public interest. Uh, I have two, two follow-up questions. One is, you know, is something I, I thought about. Even with that. I remember I was, uh, I, I was a senior in college, and I remember I was sitting there, and the, the, you know, this popped up on my phone. I'm like, what are you, Wall Street Journal? I was like, in Newton? What? And I had to open it and really like, this is down the street. Holy smokes. And one of the things I thought about at the time uh, was, you know, in terms of developing the facts of this case and, and doing the investigative work, uh, you know, obviously, you know, it turns the tape recorder off. You know, there's an a- effort here to, to conceal what's actually going on. And so I'm curious how, um, you know, in the investigation and, you know, bringing this prosecution, um, you know, those, the, how did you piece together what exactly went on in that courtroom that day? I think that was actually pretty straightforward in this right. case. Um, so you have the recording itself with the 52 second gap. Right. Right. It's Nixon-esque. Uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll go quite that far, but sure. yeah, you, you get the idea. Um, and you know who was there, mm-hmm. right? So you know that the, the courtroom deputy is there. You know the judge is there. You know the defense attorney is there. You know the prosecutor is there. You know who the people are to go talk to. Right. So you go talk to those people mm-hmm. and you have the tape and you're on your way to sort of putting together what you need to. And, and is this the U.S. Attorney's Office? Is the FBI who's doing this? Uh, uh, it, it, it was the U.S. Attorney's Office running the investigation. The agents involved. No, it was not the FBI. Um, it might have been an ICE agent. Okay. Frankly, I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember what agency did the actual on the ground investigating yeah. for us. But as cases go, assembling what evidence there is here, mm-hmm. it, is, it just is not that hard to do. The harder question is, once you have it in a box and you're looking at it, do you do the case? Right. Right? Because of the huge policy questions that go into whether you bring that kind of case. You know, another moment where this was far more stressful because we knew what would happen if we brought the case. I remember sitting there with my senior staff and thinking, like, this is totally cool, right? Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is, you know, it, it, if you, you know, this is sort of the peak of this job. These hard decisions, really yeah. hard decisions that will directly and significantly impact the life of the person you charge if you charge them. That, that's a big deal. You don't want to blow that. Right. And so, you know, a lot of thought went into whether this box of evidence was enough to justify doing the case or not. One final question, then uh, we have to get to class, if you can believe <laughs> sure. that or not. Um, yeah, we do. Uh, just the, you know, we spoke about the political atmosphere at the time. Um, do, do you feel that the justice system was impartial here? Because there, there's, you know, I think something positive that people can take away, regardless of where you stand politically, is that at the end of the day, you know, a, a grand jury of someone's peers, in this case, the judge's peers, you know, g- gave a judgment on this. You've had, uh, and I read this a few weeks ago when the motion to dismiss um, the headline came out. You had the Boston Globe say, oh, you know, uh, the, the Trump era prosecution. That was the sure. lead in the story. And, you know, I, and I thought about that and I was thinking that, well, I think the, the judge that ruled on this was an Obama appointee. And, you know, so yeah. there's some of the political uh, hand wringing that goes on. But at the end of the day, and, you know, we have to see what ends up happening here with this case. What does it say about the justice system? You, you know, you have a state court judge being rung up. Like, what does that say about, about how things work, if, if anything? Well, I think, I think this case has proceeded as it should in, yeah. in a few steps. One, um, you know, when I ran that office... It, no prosecution decisions were based were made based on politics. Mm-hmm. I would not allow that to occur. That would be wrong. It'd be unethical. I would not do that. Mm-hmm. Two, as you point out, there are checks and balances in the system. First, you have a line prosecutor who recommends prosecution. That goes to a unit level supervisor who has to agree. That then goes to the criminal chief of the office who has to agree. These are all career appointees. Then it comes up to me and I have to agree. Then they go to a grand jury to indict the case, and a grand jury of between 16 and 23 randomly selected people, they have to agree. And then you bring the case. Once it's brought, you're correct. It's in front of, uh, I think it's Judge Leo Sorokin, who's Mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, You know, it leans to the left, an Obama appointee. He denied the motion to dismiss on the trial level. It goes up to the First Circuit Court of Appeals, where you have a panel at least two of the three of whom are, are Democratic appointees, they affirm the denial of the motion to dismiss. The system is working. Right. Now that it's back down 
to the trial level. You'll have to wait and see what does the current U.S. Attorney's Office do. Rachel Rollins. We, we, well, Rachel Rollins, I, I think, is actually recused. Okay. Oh, from interesting. Considering, from considering the case, it'll be someone else in the office. Mm-hmm. But what, what do they do with it? I wouldn't fault them for looking for sort of an elegant off-ramp mm-hmm. for this. Um, I could see them trying the case. I could see them finding some way to get rid of the case. But I think so far, well, something I find ironic is that of all the commentators involved here, of all the actors outside the justice system, we were the ones not acting politically, right? Mm -hmm. All the commentators are acting from politicized motives, The, the ones who are pro and the ones who are con, right? We just tried to call balls and strikes when we brought the case. We knew it would be unprecedented, not quite unprecedented, but rare. We knew it would be controversial. But sometimes you just got to do that. You can't do the job out of fear. All right. Interesting stuff and uh, certainly an interesting case. Uh, Mr. Lelling, thank you very much for uh, for joining us. Uh, it's been Tom Blakely and Samantha Bear with uh, Andrew Lelling, former U.S. Attorney from Massachusetts, on the Just Law podcast at BC Law. Thank you very much for uh, for tuning in, and we'll catch you next time.